that should be back here again. Uh, in some ways it feels like home, there's a lot of familiar faces, but there's also a lot of new faces which is encouraging for any church. Uh, if you've not met me before, my name's Paul Cupke, um, certainly not worthy of the welcome that I got a second ago, but uh, yeah, I've been a member of this church for a long time. Uh, my wife and I and Adeline, who just walked out there, uh, moved down to Hobart last year in, in January. And uh, we've been involved with the, ch- the Christian Reform Church of Kingston down there. I'm one of the pastoral staff. Uh, since then, we've had another little one. Uh, so we're contributing to church growth, just like the Joneses, which is excellent. Um, and it's a privilege to be able to bring him back again, to be able to rock him to sleep in the back room like I used to rock Addy to sleep and that sort of stuff. It's, uh, it's very good to be home in that regard. So thank you for having us. Uh, thank you for letting us have Edgar a few weeks ago when he came down for, our ord- for my ordination and Theo's baptism. That was a really... Special thing for us and for our family, having Edgar involved with that, having him uh, mentor me since I was an 18 year old when I first moved up to Toowoomba. Um, so it was really special to have them as part of that. It made us feel like your whole church family was a part of that and we really appreciated that as well. So I know you share him with a lot of people, but thank you also for sharing him with us. Um, <laughs> that's very generous of you. Let's pray and then I'll get started. Uh, gracious Father, uh, you are the Lord of heaven and earth. Uh, and yet uh, you chose to send your son on our behalf that we might be redeemed, uh, that we may be uh, in friendship with you and have the privilege of relationship with you. I thank you for sending your spirit to help us understand that, to help us see who you really are. And as I preach this morning, I ask that you'd help me do that with great clarity, that I would speak your truth from your word and that your spirit would help us not just to hear it with our minds and appreciate it, but that you'd renew and transform our lives for your glory and the sake of your kingdom. Amen. Okay, so we're in First Peter, uh, chapter 1. I'll be reading through chunks of it as we go along. Uh, it's from a uh, series we're doing called Perfect Strangers. If you've ever read First Peter, it's a book about, written to some people throughout Asia, uh, strangers in their own land, uh, living, called to live holy lives, but that makes them separate. And so it lives with this tension of how do you live, engage with the society very faithfully, but a way that makes you stand out. Uh, and come up against ostracism and stuff like that. So we'll be looking at 1 Peter 1, 13 through 2, 3. Just be yourself. Has anyone ever given you that advice before? Just be yourself. Maybe you were nervous before a job interview. Uh, Maybe you were nervous before you met your um, girlfriends or your boyfriends, parents for the first time. can feel a bit like a job interview. Or maybe it was before your first day of school. But there's something very good about that advice. Uh, There's something very special about who you've created to be. Uh, God has made you unique. And so there's something that makes a lot of sense about giving people that advice. But as you look at around our culture, it's become a bit of an ideal or a bit of a mantra for how we think. You're told to believe in yourself or to be true to yourself. As if everything that you need for a life of happiness, for success, lives within you. Have you heard this type of thinking before? Type of thinking that appears uh, up on the board on this um, promote, motivational image. There we go. So it says, believe in yourself and all that you are. Know that there is something inside you that is greater than any obstacle. The idea is that we must be true to who we are, true to who we were born to be, and that that is the only way we'll ever be successful or happy. So is it true? Do you just need to be yourself? And is that what we should be aiming at in life? To answer these questions first, we have to answer a very basic question. Who are you? This is our first point today. Who are you? If you flick to the opening verses of 1 Peter uh, from chapter 1 verse 3, we read, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This is an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you. These recipients of this letter had received new birth. They'd been born as children of the Father, born as citizens of heaven. 
And in our passage today, you're going to see this new birth language floating throughout the passage. So that in verse 14, he's going to call them children. In verse 17, they're going to call on a father. And then in verse 22, he's going to say again, you have been born again. Who are you? If you're a Christian, you've been born as a child of your heavenly father. And that means you have profound value. What's the, what's the most valuable thing that you can think of? Is it a piece of jewellery? Maybe a nice big house or a building? Uh, if you're really fancy, it might be some sort of exotic antique. But what's the most precious or valuable item that you can think of? Let me tell you this for, for very confidently this morning. You're worth far more than that. As we open up the Bible, as we look uh, at verse 18, we have in Christ. Verse 18, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you by your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish. Your value is not set by anything in this world. It's not set by gold. It's not set by money. It's not set by any houses or possessions you can have or even by family members or friends. Your value is set because the most expensive price the universe has ever known was paid on your behalf. Jesus, God's own son, left the wonders and the privileges of heaven to come down and become human. To suffer a humiliating and painful death that you might be a child of your heavenly father. And that means that you are incredibly valuable. You have great worth. And this means that your value is not set by characteristics you were intrinsically given at your human birth. Our culture might tell you that you need to be true to yourself, that you need to be who you really are. And that's the only way that you'll be worthwhile or that you'll be happy or that you'll be successful. And it sounds good and even a bit attractive because it's at least partially true. You do have profound worth because of who God created you to be and the special and the unique way that he made you. But if you unpack the way culture thinks about it, the way we looked at that image up on the board earlier, there's a lot of self-salvation about it. Because everything that you need, it lies in you. Hope lies in being true to yourself. In being the real you. And woe to anyone who would hold you back from that. But it's a hollow way of life because it means you have to live very selfishly. Because who you are is the most important thing to you. And while your friends and your peers encourage this self, kind of self-centered way of life, you'll appreciate them. But it becomes a very isolating way to live because as soon as someone threatens your self-esteem or questions the choices that you make or the things that you think make you happy, you're going to have to reject them and walk away from them because they'll be questioning who you are and your worth. Looking inward for your sense of self-worth is a hollow way to live. As is every way of living that's not based in Jesus Christ. If that's you this morning, if you thought, have thought that being true to yourself is what you need to make you happy, if looking inside of you is the thing that's going to make the difference in your life and make you feel worthwhile, I encourage you to have another look at Jesus. Have a look at the cross and the arms outstretched for you to show the profound value of what you have. See him for who he really is. Accept that gift and be welcomed as a child of a heavenly father with all those blessings kept in store for you in heaven, as we read earlier today. If you have received this new birth, though, remember who you really are. At an incredible price, you have been reborn as a child of God. 
That's your identity. And that's an identity that captures both the profound significance of you being created uniquely by God and the value and the worth given to you by Jesus himself becoming human to shed his blood that you might be a child of the Father. Because that's what you are. You are a child of God. That's your true self. That's your true identity. And that's an identity that is worth living out. This brings us to our second point today. Like father, like son, or like daughter. This true self that we have as a child reborn to the Father in heaven is a person that's worth living out. And that requires some transformation. We'll have a look at 1 Peter 1 verse 14. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, be holy in all that you do. For it is written, be holy as I am holy. Many of you have probably heard the phrase, like father, like son. Uh, Sometimes you don't have to look very far, probably even in this building, to see uh, children who bear resemblance to their parents. It might be uh, character traits. It might be in appearance. Um, It might be in certain mannerisms that you see repeated down the family line where the father uh, has his, his image in the son. The same thing is what Peter is saying here is that we are to bear the image of our heavenly father and the image of his holiness. This is a non-negotiable expectation of the Christian life. As obedient children, we are to be holy. Just like our heavenly father is holy. It all sounds a bit Old Testament and and works-based, doesn't it? As as grace-driven New Testament Christians, uh, we're very comfortable with the fact that we're definitely not holy. That we're sinners, saved by grace, through faith, and that has nothing to do with our works. So what are we supposed to do with the command that calls us to be holy? The very first thing to do is remember who you are. Remember who you've been born to be. The Bible is very clear. We're not going to earn God's favour on our own. In our sinfulness, we're not going to be able to win God over, to be able to please Him or to be able to contribute in any way to our salvation. The Bible is very clear on that. That's not something we're able to do. But that's exactly why new birth is such a good metaphor for the Christian life. Little babies don't contribute anything to their new birth. It just sort of happens to them. But after they're born, they're expected to grow up and mature so that they become fully functional adults functioning within society. The same is true of the Christian life. God works in grace and we are reborn. We're not doing anything for that. God works first. But then as we're born, the command comes to be holy as we live out this new life that we have been given in Christ. To be holy as God is holy. Equipped by his spirit. I want to encourage you, don't mess that order up. To mess that order up and to think that you've got to be holy to earn God's favour is to end up in a moralistic works-based righteousness. It'll flat kill your soul. You can't do it. Grace comes first. God intervenes on our behalf first. But the call to be holy isn't a works-based righteousness then, but a call to be who we really are, to live out the identity we've been given in this new birth. It's being our true selves, the true you. So what does holy mean? We speak about holy a lot and we use the word a lot, but sometimes we don't actually understand fully what it encompasses because it's a rather foreign concept to us. In the Bible, holiness has two sort of connected parts. The first of these is God's absolute otherness, distinct from creation, over and above it and exceeding it in every way. He is the one that has no rivals. No other gods exist and there is none like him. It also describes in the second part his moral and his ethical perfection. 
He's not only free from sin, but also unable to accept the corruption that sin represents because he is so pure. If you want to look, that, look up a passage like Isaiah 6, you'll see that very clearly. And so when the Bible talks about holiness, it talks in the language of to cut or to make separate. So R.C. Sproul talks about this uh, best explained in English as the, with the idiom, the cut above. As you find an item of clothing or something of great value that is far superior to anything else, you say, it's a cut above. And so God is a cut above us in every single way, in his distinctness, in his excellence, and his complete moral purity. That's what holiness looks like, the separateness and the brilliance of God. So what then does a holy life look like? Holy life is a life in accordance with God's own character. The character of God revealed in the Bible, but also revealed most clearly and most finely in His Son, Jesus Christ. Holy life will mean that we need to walk away from sin, from cultural expectations and customs that we freely would have once participated in. It also means that things are going to change in the way you evaluate what's actually right or wrong. In the way you think about those things will be fundamentally different to those around you because you're basing them at a different point in who God is himself. As a result, you'll probably end up looking different to the world around you. Perhaps as an alien or a stranger or a foreigner. Certainly that's the language of First Peter. And that may well end up leaving you ostracised. It might end up leaving you completely rejected. But that certainly wouldn't put you anywhere different than what the first recipients of this letter to First Peter were. And I think that that sort of a status is increasingly coming for us as Christians in our culture today. That's becoming progressively more uh, tense in terms of how we relate to people. In nature, if you look at this slide behind, animals tend to blend into their environment uh, for either protection or for hunting. Like the nighthawk in that image there, to save you the trouble, it's actually just here. Animals blend into their environment so they're virtually indistinguishable from the habitat around them. But this image isn't to be a parable for our Christian lives. Our Christian lives were not called to blend into the world so that we make no difference or there's no discernible difference in us and our surroundings. We're called to be holy, to be set apart, to represent God and his character, to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus Christ himself. Now, holy living, of course, isn't easy. Uh, so before we look at how that plays out, I thought I might clarify some things about what holiness is not because there's a few traps that we fall into. First, don't confuse holiness in the world with withdrawal from the world. So many times in church history, people have sought to be holy by removing themselves from the world and the, the defiling and evil effects of it. But Jesus didn't come to earth to be a holy hermit, to set himself apart from the world, but to be actively engaged in it so that he could redeem it. If you're going to read the rest of the, rest of the book of 1 Peter, you'll see that being holy isn't just for our own benefit, but it's actually to be a missional way of life to the world around us, to the world that's watching. So holiness isn't withdrawing from the world. Also, don't, second, don't confuse holiness with re religious boundary markers. Throughout the history of Christians, people have set to define what Christian behaviour is or what holiness is by sets of things that we can do, religious actions. That might be not drinking alcohol. That might be going to church every Sunday. That might be not swearing. It might be only going to Christian schools or only listening to Christian music or only watching Christian movies. It might be speaking up against the same-sex marriage debate. But if you have a close look at all those things, they're all external behaviours. They're all good things and a holy person may well do them, but they don't define holiness. Because you could do every single one of those things and just end up proud and self-sufficient. 
self-righteous. And that's not holy. Holiness is a matter of a heart shaped by God in his grace. Not about a certain set of religious boundary markers. Finally, holy people may stand out, but holiness is not standing out. There's a lot of reasons why you can stand out in society. You can be proud, you can be judgmental, you can be flat obnoxious. And people will reject you for that and will ostracise you for that. But that's not holiness. It's not holiness. So I can assure you, if you live a holy life in our culture, you will stand out. And you may well suffer some sort of difficulty. But standing out or seeking to stand out or even seeking animosity with the world isn't holiness. That'll just end up bringing the name of Jesus into disrepute and failing to represent him for who he really is. One of the areas in my life where uh, quite naturally and without trying I've stood out more than others is as a, as a Christian uh, playing football in football clubs where there's been very few other Christians. Um, quite naturally I stood out for three pretty basic reasons. One, I didn't drink much. Two, my language was different. And three, I was saving sex until I got married. Now, from a biblical point of view, they're three very straightforward things. But to think that that's what holiness looks like in a football club would be to confuse holiness with a set of religious boundary markers. For sure, they're an important part of my holy living within the football club. But that doesn't make holiness because I also struggle in a whole heap of other different areas. Because I cared too much about what they thought of me. I didn't always have the conversations about God that I should have. Because I cared about my reputation and wanted to be known as a good footballer, I'd sometimes do things for my own gain rather than for the benefit of the team. Or sometimes I'd yell at my teammates if they didn't do things I expected them to do. Because I valued a comfortable life, I applauded and secretly envied some of their life choices that they made buying new cars or building bigger houses or going on particular holidays. I still desired those things as a high priority and so I struggled with that. I really did want to genuinely live a holy life as I was in those relationships. But to be honest, the picture was quite incomplete. So what about you? Are you distinct? In what ways do you blend into the picture of our culture? Or are you not even in the picture because you don't have any relationships with non-Christian people? Have you confused holiness for a set of religious behaviours and just living them out in society? Or have you been responsible for being proud and judgmental And as a result, brought the name of Jesus into disrepute and put people off him instead of making him look attractive. If we're honest, we've all failed. But don't be discouraged. Don't even be embarrassed. And don't condemn yourself. Because remember how we got into this position in the first place, which is by grace. Turn once more to God in repentance. Admit your sin and admit your failures and in faith ask for his forgiveness. There is grace and we grow through repentance. And you know what, God, he's far better than we give him credit for. Much to my surprise and even despite me at times, has used my life in football for his glory in ways I can't have even imagined. Certainly not because I'm special, but because he is very gracious and he is far wiser than me. That brings us to our final point today, becoming like our Father. The Holy Spirit hasn't left us without some practical things we can do as we grow to holiness. Um, I certainly encourage you to read the whole book of 1 Peter because as the book goes on, it's going to see how this plays out in different spheres of our lives. But even in our passage today, we're given three other commands that I think are very useful as we grow into holiness. The first of these is found in verse 13. Therefore, with holy minds that are alert and fully sober, 
Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Set your hope on the grace that is to be revealed. With a clear mind, sharp mind, firmly focused on who you are, who you've been reborn to be and the hope that that brings. That will give you the endurance you need to continue in this life. Be assured of your final outcome. When my family was down from Old Nation a couple of weeks ago, I took them on a walk up Mount Wellington, which is the, the big mountain out the back of Hobart. And I'd never actually been on this track before, and to be honest, it was a bit longer than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> uh, so we're following this track along, and my, my family began to doubt me a little bit and said, do you, do you even know where you're going? <laughs> but I was confident in the track that I was on. I was pretty sure that if I continued on that track, it would end up in another track that I did know, and that that would take us up to the top of the mountain. My confidence of knowing where that track was going to go gave me the ability to give up, to be able to deal with the jokes uh, and, and the ridicule and not turn back and go get the car. And so in the same way that Peter says, set your hope very firmly on who you are in Christ and what you've, what you've been given, on that new birth. Keep your mind sharp. Remember your identity as a reborn child of the Father. And the hope that that gives you with an inheritance that will never perish, spoil or fade. Because that's a hope that can carry you to your final destination. Our second command comes in verse 22. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for one another, love one another deeply from the heart. As Christians, we're not only children. We're not saved as Christians to be independent, to live our lives in isolation, but to belong to a community like this. We may end up being socially alienated by the lives that we live in our culture, but the idea is that that's offset by the love and the encouragement and security we have in this forum as we encourage one another in what's going on. This love though, this sincere love is only possible, not because we're better people, but because we've been reborn again of God and we share his character. And that's what makes that sort of love possible. We don't come in here to huddle and to hide from the dark and scary world out there. But we come in here to encourage one another and to support one another on that journey. And that's a journey that will be impossible. It'll be impossible if we have difficult and troublesome relationships in this building. If we wear one another down by judgments, by complaining or by criticism or by gossip, We'll never have the energy to be meaningfully engaged with the world out there because this will sap it all. Amen. This community needs to be a place of safety, of refuge, of unity, of encouragement, of accountability. In short, a community of deep, heartfelt love. That's what this community needs if we are to live holy lives. Maybe you can get that ball rolling today by having a chat to someone after church about how you're going with this living life in our culture. Maybe you can talk about some of the struggles you have and even pray for one another on that journey. We're given each other to support us and encourage us and we need the love of each other to do that. Final command comes in chapter 2 verse 2. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up into your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Again, we get another reminder of this new birth that we've been given, this new birth that we've been born into. Just in the same way that a little infant urgently and regularly craves the nourishment that comes from its mother's milk. So are we as Christians to urgently and regularly crave the nourishment we need for this new life that we have. 
This life we have needs to be nourished. I remember talking to a friend uh, about the discouragement they felt as parents when they filled out the baby book and wrote failure to thrive inside the book. I can't think of anything more sort of discouraging as a parent than having failure to thrive written about your child. Um, you'll be pleased to know that that child is actually happy and healthy now. But it could easily be something that was written about us. Failed to thrive. Many of us have tasted that the Lord has good. But we haven't been continually nourished by that so that we can grow up healthy in, and mature. Many of us have failed to take the nourishment that this new life in Christ actually needs. And have become now nourished as a, pro, as a result. We've failed to thrive. Peter's already spoken just a couple of verses earlier about this imperishable word of God. The hope of the God's word that gives us confidence in the promises that God has made to us. Confidence in the hope of the gospel. But what Peter has in mind here is more than just a simple reading of God's word. Because he's quoting Psalm 34 verse 8 where David says to us, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Amen. Do you understand what Peter's saying here? If you don't want to end up weak and hungry, if you don't want to end up malnourished like those lions, if you don't want to fail to thrive, you need to seek the Lord and the sustenance you need for this life we've been born into. Hearing and reading God's word is vital. And yet you've not fully or truly taken that nourishment until by God's spirit and by prayer that has begun to form and shape your heart. Until the habits and the old things you did, the sins you used to do have been removed. Because as those things are removed, you'll more instinctively and constantly crave the nourishment that we need for this life. The nourishment that Christ gives us. Don't fail to thrive. Don't just taste and see that the Lord is good. But drink deeply of the nourishment that Christ gives us. If you've received new birth, let me encourage you this morning, live out who you really are. Bear the likeness of your Father and His holy character. Sure, it will make you a stranger in this world and may make you be ostracised at times. But that will only serve to remind you that this world is not your home. Set your hope very firmly in the gospel and what you've been born into, in this new identity you have in Christ. Love one another deeply from the heart and drink richly and deeply and hungrily from the nourishment that comes in Christ. Digest his word. Shed sin. Pray. Repent. Encourage one another on this journey. And then as Peter himself says in chapter 5, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let me pray. Gracious Father, it is such a privilege to call you our Father. That people like us, uh, definitely not holy, would be called your children is a wonder and a testament to your grace. Uh, to the generous love that you have where you would give us such great value to come to earth, uh, to die and to rise again that we may be redeemed and be your children. Father, in your mercy, by your spirit, help us to live out that new identity as holy children of a holy God. Not because we're strong, but because you are glorious and we want your name to be praised and promoted in this place. Please shape our hearts, give us the courage we need, and continue to guide us to repentance when we fail. May all of this happen for your glory, for the honour of your Son, 
and the extension of your kingdom. Amen.